We've talked a lot in the past on this channel about the blockchain trilemma, scaling, security, and decentralization. Cardano was built for those requirements, but some of our competitors are just waking up to the potential that their current mediocre performance on the security leg might become a horrific train wreck in a post-AI crypto world. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss the reality of AI exploit spotting in crypto, some very nice Cardano stats, and the SEC once again deciding on a very silly course of action. If you're as uncomfortable as I am with the whites of this guy's eyes actually being light blue, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Have you ever noticed how capable humans are of denying potential outcomes in rapidly changing circumstances? Humans are really good at putting those things out of their brains, if, especially if they're bad outcomes. They're really good at denying that those potential outcomes exist when circumstances are changing very rapidly. And we're going to see a little bit of that in this clip. Stake with Pride is always the best at picking out these clips from longer podcasts, and this is no exception. So I'm just going to go ahead and play this for you, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. I also think that large language models are going to be really good at attacking contracts, and they're going to be like, I think the advantage, the natural advantage to attack versus defense is going to grow with large language models. Because I think it's a lot easier for a large language model to find a vulnerability than it is for a large language model to fix a vulnerability. Finally, the Cardano stance can win. Wait, what, why? Formally verified. Oh, 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 I see, I see. Peer reviewed, formally verified. <laughs> okay, got it. Well, that's Cardano itself, right? Okay, okay. So at this point, the guy in the top left with the orange glasses, he goes on to explain that really they're talking about Cardano smart contracting language, Plutus, and then he proceeds to take a couple of jabs at Plutus. And they're all kind of laughing at the absurdity that maybe the the fans, the enthusiasts of Cardano may have been right all along. Maybe this very careful, scientific, rigorous approach to building a blockchain ecosystem and its smart contracting language, maybe that was right all along. Maybe there is something to formal verifiability. Maybe that was the right approach as opposed to the, I'll call it haphazard approach of solidity, where you just kind of create this this uh, this smart contract language and throw it out there. You know, I mean, I think it was an important step in the history of you know the development of blockchains, but. We can do better all these years later. I think that's the opinion of most of us in uh, in Cardano probably and, and in a lot of blockchains. I think a lot of blockchains have attempted to do a little better than Solidity because the history of Solidity has been that it, it has been a mediocre performer on one of the three legs of the blockchain trilemma. We've got decentralization, scaling, and security, and Solidity infamously has been a smart contract programming language that has produced a lot of security failures, a lot of security exploits. It's been a mediocre performer on this leg and everybody knows it. It has not been, it has not, uh, it has not pr produced a lack of security <laughs> exploits. Everybody knows this. So the problem, the reason why this is so ridiculous, you can see even at this point in the video where we've paused here, they're giving full on full tooth laughs here. This is all so absurd. The reason why it's absurd is not even so much that Cardano may have been right. I think it's because the flip side of the coin is very bad. If it turns out that in a post AI era, we have a heightened level of exploits, that's very bad. If the blockchain ecosystem you're a part of has been a, a poor performer, a mediocre performer in security in a pre-AI era. 
So I think I think they're 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 sort of grappling with this. The guy on the left has obviously considered the irony of the situation. Maybe Cardano was right all along. The guy on the top, the top left there. The guy on the top right, you can tell, might be considering this for the first time. I think he was sort of thinking, oh, all of, all of crypto is in big trouble, which is true to a certain extent. But if if you're going into an era when all of a sudden AI is publicly available to everyone. You no longer have to think about things in terms of this Venn diagram where you have people who are willing to exploit smart contracts and people who are able to exploit smart contracts. Because with these, what he's what he's implying is that with large language models like GPT-4, all of a sudden you have the ability in your back pocket to get past the biggest threshold to being able to exploit smart contracts. That's spotting potential exploits. We saw this on the first day of GPT-4 public availability. Somebody fed an Ethereum smart contract, a Solidity smart contract into GPT-4 and said, find me an exploit and tell me how to exploit it. And GPT-4 delivered on exactly that. So all of a sudden, it's no longer a Venn diagram. People wanting to do it and people able to do it. All of a sudden, all the people who are willing to exploit these smart contracts, they have also become the people who are able to do it. This is super problematic if you're already in a blockchain ecosystem that historically has had a mediocre performance in terms of security much worse to be over there than to be someplace like Cardano that was built to be a high performer, especially on that security leg of the trilemma. It's really interesting because he just explained why he thinks that AI, large language models, will, will aid attack of smart contracts more than it will the defense of smart contracts. Yet at the same time, it's laughable to him that a blockchain ecosystem that designed its smart contracting language specifically for military grade security could be in a more advantageous position in this kind of an era, this kind of an AI large language model era than a blockchain ecosystem that has always had a smart contracting language that is notorious for being written with exploits. Allow me to be clear, I'm not predicting doom for the EVM world and flawless victory for Cardano. I don't think it'll really work like that. But I do think AI is one of those things we can't really see past it. We can't really see over the hill. I think there are a lot of non-predictable things on the other side of that hill that we won't be able to foresee. And when we're talking about, you know, this this part of crypto that has already seen a crazy number of robberies, I'm saying, man, it's not looking good in a post AI world. Leaving the world of the rise of machines and coming back to Cardano proper, here's the essential Cardano IOG weekly development report. So if you if you haven't been looking at this, this might be a good thing to check out. Uh, there's some very nice stats in here like these. 1,227 projects building on Cardano, 71,786 token policies, 65 million total transactions, 7,783 Pluto scripts, over 8 million native tokens. Truly impressive. And if you want to know what all the different teams are doing, this is a great place to figure out what's going on. Here we've got updates from the Lace team, the Adrestia team. Uh, updates on smart contracts, updates on Marlowe, updates on Basho, including Hydra and Mithril, updates on Voltaire and Catalyst. So you can come on over here to EssentialCardano.io and find these updates on a weekly basis. I am about to shock you. You will be utterly surprised by this. It turns out that the SEC has decided to do something silly again. I know, you're so surprised, you're so shocked. So here's what's going on. This is the reopening of a comment period for amendment of a rule. So we've talked about this before, and I promise I'm not gonna bore you. We're not gonna make this super boring. I'm just gonna give you the background you need to understand what's going on here. So it's not gonna get super boring, don't worry. But here's how it works. Congress will pass laws 
And then, you know, laws like in the case of securities, these important laws like the 1933 Act and the 1934 Act, the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act. And then agencies like the SEC, they will promulgate, they're authorized to promulgate rules under those laws because Congress doesn't have time or the ability or the expertise to pass a law that can address every single corner case that might happen under that law. So they rely on the agencies, they authorize the agencies to pass regulations, to promulgate regulations to address all those little details, all those little corner cases that might happen under that law. The law is like this big overarching thing, and then you got these more fine grained regulations. So here they're trying to amend one of those rules. And this is an important one because this is the rule about the definition of an exchange under the 1934 Securities and Exchange Act. And yes, you can already guess where this is going. They're going to try to sort of broaden this definition so that it more, more appropriately applies to crypto exchanges like we have in DeFi, like DEXs. They're going after DeFi here. So the original comment period was from May 9th, 2022 to June 13th, 2022. And you might've noticed if you watched the hearings where Gensler had to show up in front of the House of Representatives last week, he was accused by congressmen of having short abbreviated comment periods. So what happens? We get this reopening of a comment period where they say, okay, now we're gonna reopen that comment period. We're gonna try to get more feedback from the public about this rule we're proposing. And we're gonna open it up now and it's going to stay open until June 13th or a date that is 30 days after the publication of this proposed amendment in the Federal Register. So this is going to go on until something like June 13th. Down here on page five, they tell you exactly what they're changing. And one of the most important changes is that they want to add the phrase communication protocols as an example of an established non-discretionary method that an organization, association, or group of persons can provide to bring together buyers and sellers of securities. So what they're doing here is trying to close that loophole because what they've seen in the past is that DeFi protocols would say, hey, bro, don't regulate me. I'm just free speeching. I'm just a protocol to allow sellers to communicate what price they'll accept and buyers to communicate what price they will offer. Don't, don't regulate me. I'm just free speeching, bro. And the SEC wants to close that loophole. They don't want to deal with free speech arguments. Down here on page seven, they let you know purpose of the reopening release. And they tell you straight up the purpose of reopening the release is to address comments that requested more information about how this would apply to crypto and DeFi specifically. They say, given these comments, the commission is issuing this reopening release regarding the potential effects of the proposed amendment on trading systems for crypto asset securities and trading systems using distributed ledger technology, their favorite their favorite alternate phrase for blockchains, including systems commoners characterize as various forms of DeFi. So this is all about crypto and DeFi. This document is 166 pages long. We're not gonna get into all the gory details here today, but there are a few things I would like to point out. One of them is they're straight up telling you they do not care about custody. They don't care if you think you have custody of your assets in the DeFi system. This is not a part of their calculation. They do not care. It's not a part of their analysis. They say some commenters state that because so-called DeFi trading systems do not custody assets, they should not be subject to exchange regulation. They go on to describe that. They say, neither exist the existing rule nor rule 3B16 as proposed to be amended requires an organization, association, or group of persons to provide custodial services to be considered in exchange. They're saying custody has nothing to do with their definition of whether or not it's an exchange. So they're they're letting DeFi people know they don't care about that. That is not, uh, that is not any kind of a line for them. Then they go on to talk about group of persons as the exchange. And they are also letting you know that it doesn't have to be one person, according to them. Down here on page 22, they say, the existence of smart contracts on blockchain does not materialize in the absence of human activity or a machine or code controlled or deployed by humans. The commission understands that typically, including for DeFi, a single organization 
constitutes, maintains, or provides the marketplace or facilities for bringing together buyers and sellers securities or otherwise performs with respect to securities of the functions commonly performed by a stock exchange. They're saying they understand you're trying to pretend like you're like governed by all these disparate people all over all over the globe and there's not some small group that's actually maintaining the platform but they know that's that's the pretense but they're letting you know they also know that it's typically a single organization that's maintaining the platform and they say that also doesn't matter to them. While it is common today for a single organization to provide a marketplace or facilities to bring together buyers and sellers of securities and meet the definition of an exchange, an exchange can also exist where a marketplace or facilities are provided by a group of persons rather than a single organization. So they're saying, even if it is this diverse group of people, they don't care. They're still going to call you an exchange. Finally, Coin Center has hilariously submitted this comment on the proposed change. So what they did, they wrote they wrote a, a, a beautiful little paper here explaining why this is all ridiculous. And then they also included this. They included this code and they say, an exchange of tokens can be made by replacing the example data in these fields with data related to the buyers and sellers relevant Ethereum addresses and their intentions to trade tokens at particular prices. If the message is filled out properly, signed with the relevant cryptographic keys and broadcast on the peer-to-peer -peer Ethereum network, it is likely that an exchange will occur. By filing this comment letter publicly, Coin Center has made available a communications protocol that can effectuate trades in securities. They're pointing out that their comment to the proposed rule would itself be considered an exchange under certain types of strict readings of this rule. They're pointing out the absurdity of this rule. And then they say, we will not be registering. However, I hope, I hope more enlightened minds in DC understand the ridiculousness of all this and that those those uh those minds prevail over the people who are pushing these kinds of rule changes but under this sec maybe that's not likely i hope you had a great weekend and i'll talk to you tomorrow